Good morning, Port Orchard Seventh-day Adventist Church. Welcome to our Bible study this morning live. We have four panelists with us this morning. Over here we have Levi, Levi Cobb. We have, I always say your name wrong, Vixie Shaver. 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 And Shaver. And we have Vera Hedrick. My name is Fred Rutan. We would really like you to join in at any time as we go through this study. First of all, I'd like to start everything with a word of prayer. So let's bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your holy word that we have the great opportunity to open up and study and learn from. We ask that you guide our words, guide the panel's words, and send the Holy Spirit to, to give us thoughts that we need to say. We ask in your name, amen. So this quarterly lesson is going to be a real interesting lesson. I think it's well needed because we know that over time Christians have relied less on personal study of the Bible. They spend less time in the Word every day, every week. Instead, they often rely on somebody else to interpret Scripture. You can just think of the dangers that that brings. Because if they get somebody who doesn't have a good overall look at scriptures, they get some errant ideas that can be carried off into some pretty strange places. Our church uses the concept of only the scriptures for our beliefs. And of course, the scriptures leads where? Back to Christ. It's all about Christ, really. So here we, here we are. We have this lesson study that's, that's, that's going to tell us and show us how to interpret Scripture. I know in, in, in our class, if they choose to follow the lesson this quarterly, I'm also going to interject how do you find passages? How do you, given a subject, how do you study for yourself? That's also a very important subject. So for those of you who have, who clicked on the link um, to the, the quarterly, you'll notice that the, that Sunday's lesson is about, is, is entitled, The Living Word of God. And it points to Moses' last words. That's in Deuteronomy 32, 45 to 47. So let's look there right now. Boy, I hadn't counted on holding something while I do everything with one hand. <laughs> Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 32, 45 to 47. Moses finished speaking all these words to all Israel, and he said to them, Set your hearts on all the words which I testify among you today, which you shall command your children to be careful to observe all the words of this law, for it is not futile, it is not foolish, in other words, for you, because it is your life. And by this word you shall prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to possess. Moses is telling them it's not futile to follow the law. It's not foolish to follow the law. 
Why? Because it's our lives. Our lives are at stake. This is not just a, a thing that we just do because we like to. It's our life is at stake. And these are some of Moses' last words of the children of Israel. I think that's, that's a very good insight to how we should view the, um, the scripture. How important is it? It's our life. It's not, it's foolish to follow someone else. It's foolish. We should follow the Bible. That's why it's so important for us to um, just learn how to study for ourselves. Not, not necessarily just how to interpret, but how to study. Two different things. If we don't know how to research and, and, and the Bible and find the text we need to find, what good is interpretation? So our, our next text that, that this points to is John 1, 1 to 5. One hand, it is tricky again. John 1, 1 to 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. You notice the title of, of Sunday's study is The Living Word of God. It has a couple of contexts, really couple of contexts. One is that the Bible is for anybody in all times of history. There's something for you. There's something for you no matter where you are in life. You could be a drunk in the streets, lying, dirty, filthy. The Bible has something for you. The other concept, too, is that since John calls Christ the Word, then the Word still lives, doesn't it? The Word still lives. He lives today. Anyway, that's my takeaway from Sunday's lesson. Okay. I have Monday's lesson, and it is titled... Who wrote the Bible and where? And those are questions. And another question I would put there is, and why? We are told that the Bible is written by 66 different writers from many different backgrounds. And they all come from, it's, it's an expand of the um, B.C., to A.D. There's Moses, who was born, who was royalty, that ended up in the desert. Amos, a sheep breeder. Jeremiah, a son of a priest. Dan, Daniel, who was a young boy, but in captivity. In the New Testament, we have Matthew, a tax collector. A Pharisees, Paul, and fishermen, one, and one was exiled. And then we have Luke, who was a doctor. Now, all these people had things in common. Luke um, got his by investigating. It says it in Luke 1. 
But an another thing they had in common is they were all called by God. And they were all inspired. In fact, 2 Timothy 3.16, it says, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. So all these people who wrote the Bible were called. So in order to be called, you have a choice whether you want to proceed or not proceed. And also, and then I got to thinking about inspiration of God. What is that? To be inspired, you got to have a connection, and it's an influence. The Strong's Concordance says it is a breath, to breathe, to be breath upon, or breathe upon. Um, John 20, 22. Jesus breath or breathe on his disciples, and, and then he said, peace be to you. Receive the Holy Spirit. Job 32.8 says, the breath of the Lord gives understanding. 2 Peter 1.21, holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So, inspiration is the breath of God. And where God is, is holy. So that's where you get holy. And Moses, um, the burning bush, God said, take off your shoes for you are on ho holy ground. You are in the presence of God when you are in the Bible. And I think that's something we need to be thinking of. Um, God created human language languages, so he is more than capable to inspire. And when I read that, I thought, man, that is cool. I never really thought about it like that. Um, to be inspired again is to be in the presence of God. The breath of the Lord is the presence of God. And when you're moved by the Spirit, you are in the presence of God. Um, feel that there's so many writers out there on so many different continents that kind of are harmonious. That are what? Harmonious all together. It gives you, uh, to me, it's encouraging. I had someone ask me about a week and a half ago, how do you know which translation is the right translation? How do you know the Bible is right? And it goes back to the many different people who wrote it, that God had inspired. He had different people with different backgrounds to reach different people in different backgrounds. Just like all of us, we're all different from different backgrounds, different ages, different everything. But we all can get something out of the Bible. And the Bible speaks of hope and it and speaks of the salvation of God. And without hope, what do we have? We don't have anything. You think all of that is still relevant today? Oh. Everything, every one of the stories and everything? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because we can all relate to uh, captivity. Nobody wants to be in captivity, but if you end up being in captivity, you can relate to them. When you're fishing, you can relate to a fisherman. Um, so many different things. Uh, poetry love stories, and I could say if you're into violence, it has violence, <laughs> but um, anyway, um, Proverbs 22:20 20 says, I have written to you excellent things of counsel, and the eye is speaking of wisdom, and wisdom comes from God, from James 1, 5, and Proverbs 2, Six. And if it was not the inspiration of God, we would not have hope for a fallen world. It would be just another book that would come and go. The Bible has lasted throughout all ages. Um, it changes lives. What other book changes lives? Well, you can say video games change lives. So I guess you can speak to its consistency. Because yes. it speaks to the human condition. Yes, yes. So. 
Well, the, um, oh, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. There's changed lives and there's changed lives. Mm -hmm. You can either change for the worst or change for the best. But the Bible is inspired by God and he changes for the best. He changes That's for the good. True. Video games change. may change for the worst. Right. So it's who are you inspired by? Who are you going to be influenced by? Well, kind of going off of what you were saying, Levi, um, about, you know, are all the stories relevant for today? Um, you know, we look at the story of the woman caught in adultery, for example. Now, we can't necessarily relate to hauling her into the town square and saying, let's stone her. However, we can relate to the shame that is associated with that story. So is it necessarily a case of, well, we're going to do exactly what they did in Bible times because that's how it is? No. However, <laughs> the feelings, the emotion, the human experience that goes with those stories speaks to all people in all times. Right. You know, there's a there's an enduring theme of the Bible, and it's not necessarily the customs or the... Um, you know, evidences of the culture, it's the humanity of the scriptures. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the fact that it was written by so many different people doesn't cause me personally to lose faith in the Bible. It causes me to gain faith in the Bible because you have so many people from so many different backgrounds coming together to write a fairly cohesive book over the course of about 1,500 years. You know, it's, it's amazing what the Bible is and what it accomplishes. And as this week is pointing out, the uniqueness of the scriptures. And the excellent things that are in the scriptures. And one person that did write the Bible is God. He wrote it with the Ten Commandments with his finger. I like the Ellen White quote uh, here at the end of the, of, what is this, Monday? I mm -hmm. uh, said, God has been pleased to communicate his truth to the world by human agencies, and he himself, by his Holy Spirit, qualified men and, ena and enabled them to do his work. He guided the mind in the selection of what to speak and what to write. The treasure was entrusted to earthen vessels, yet it is, nonetheless, from heaven. Pretty yes. much just what you, what you said. God wrote the Bible, and he inspired it through men. Right. Yep. And that's, that's my Monday's lesson. So for Tuesday, we are looking at the Bible as prophecy. And I was looking at all the different verses that it's having us look up, and I'm going to be honest, I found it kind of lacking. And here's why. All of the prophecies were solely about Jesus. And while Jesus and his ministry are the focus of our study here are the focus of the Bible and our lives. There are other prophecies that this lesson kind of pushed to the side, prophecies that establish the historical accuracy of the Bible, the legitimacy of the Bible. Um, and so it was a little bit of a, a struggle preparing for um, Tuesday's lesson, preparing for the Bible as prophecy without looking at the the with the breadth of this prophecy that the Bible contains. Um, going into the prophecies about Jesus, as the lesson pointed out, there are 66 specific prophecies about Jesus. That's not counting the prophecies that are through, uh, through an act, like, for example, the sacrificial system we know now that that entire system was pointing to the coming of Jesus, but it's not specifically written out like this is a prophecy necessarily. Um, looking at the different prophecies that were presented, it was really interesting because you can really look at the New Testament, really look at the Gospels and see these fulfilled in Jesus' life. You can see that he came from the line of Judah, as Genesis 49 mentions, that he was a ruler from the line of Judah, that as Psalms 22 
talks about, there was a lot of a lot of pain and agony that he went through with getting his hands and feet pierced. I don't know about you guys, but that just <clears throat> sounds really terrible. Painful. Very painful. <laughs> just horrible, horrible torture, to be perfectly honest. Um, Isaiah 53 beautiful chapter of the Bible, not just the verses that were selected for this study, but just the, the chapter in general speaks of the suffering that Jesus went through in such, such deep words. Um, you know, it's poetry that's talking about this pain that Jesus would go through in later times. And so we can certainly see all of these prophecies fulfilled in Jesus. But for just a minute, I want to touch on other prophecies that I feel that it would be very helpful for people to look at as well. Um, looking at Daniel. Daniel has a lot of mm -hmm. very, um, very specific prophecies that if you look back at history, you can see them play out. For example, Daniel 2 and Daniel 7, where it talks about the image made of the different, um, uh, different metals and the beasts in Daniel 7, where you can see these kind of odd-looking animals, grotesque almost animals, but they had the characteristics that the nations that would come had. So you can look at Daniel, and there are skeptics out there that would say that Daniel was written later, looking back on the things that had happened. Um, but even if Daniel was written in the second century BC, there's still prophecy in there that still hadn't happened. And so it's really amazing to look back and to see Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and then the fact that the world has not had one kind of supreme ruler for the last 1,500 years. We've been divided like the feet in the statue. So it's really important to look at these things to establish not only the Bible as an accurate prophetic source, but also, okay, hold on, um, but also establish the Bible as a historical document. So we have a question then from Dustin. It says, why was it so important for Jesus to meticulously fulfill over 100 Old Testament prophecies during his time? Well, the fact that he fulfilled all these prophecies made his ministry irrefutable. So the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they chose not to see these things fulfilled. But if you look at the prophecies and if you look at Jesus' life and how it fulfilled those prophecies, it leaves absolutely no doubt that Jesus is the person, the promised Messiah promised even back in Genesis 3. And so why it was important for these prophecies to be fulfilled was so that there would be no doubt. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no doubt that Jesus' hands were pierced, that his feet were pierced, that he's still going to have those scars would in you, the new heaven and new earth. Would you say there'd be no doubt too because in that the Bible is the word of God because of the prophecies? I would say so. I mm -hmm. mean... And inspiration. Yeah. Have you ever heard the argument that Jesus just knew these prophecies and fulfilled them by his own volition? Can you give us an example of some that he could not have known how to fill, fulfill it by himself? Would you willingly have your hands and feet pierced just to prove a point? Maybe. <laughs> a die on the cross. There's, there's <laughs> prophecies that would have been really painful. The, just the thought is terrible. It's something you don't want to have 
happen to yourself. It, like, most people would not willingly go through pain, and not just a little bit of pain, a lot of pain, just to prove a point. Like, you wouldn't willingly die just to say, yeah, well, look guys, I've done this, I've proved a point, now I'm dead, but I proved a point. It, it doesn't exactly. really make sense. It makes sense, yeah. There's a comment by Sharon. She says that when the Pharisees saw this, they probably thought Jesus was fulfilling these prophecies, seeing that he was a brilliant rabbi. He knew the scriptures, right? And, um, and so... Yeah, she would pretty much is just uh, she was reiterating kind of what we just talked about a yeah. little bit, saying that Jesus could have pre-fulfilled these just knowing. But what Vixie was pointing out was one of the one of the prophecies was saying that he was going to be pierced, yeah. Yeah. and the way he was pierced was why would somebody knowingly do that to themselves to prove a joke or prove some kind yes. of it's crucifixion point. and resurrection. Okay, let's go with the prophecies of history. Who can um, fulfill prophecies of history just by doing it? Nobody can. History is going to be hit. Yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to go how it's going to go. How, that's right. Nobody can fulfill the prophecy of history. So, in the same sense. Oh, we have an example by Dustin um, saying that they cast lot for Jesus' clothing. That's something that Jesus couldn't say. Hey, so would you guys mind just like ripping up my clothes and casting lots for yeah. them? That'd be great if you could. Can you explain Thanks. casting lots? Maybe someone's listening that has no idea what that means. <laughs> So it, it really depended on where you were. Um, often it was kind of like drawing straws. Pretty much? Were they yeah. like auctioning off his clothing? More or less, okay. but they, um, yeah, they didn't want to divide up his main cloak because that was one solid piece of fabric. So they actually, that's why they auctioned that particular item off was because it was such a unique clothing item. Mm -hmm. Um, the other clothes, they just ripped up. They're like, okay, you get this portion, you get this portion. Here's an arm, you know, here's the, the bottom half. They, mm -hmm. they divided that up. But his main robe, they went ahead and they cast lots, which is, yeah, like I said, it's kind of like drawing straws. You have everyone's name on something, and then you, you know, draw it out of a hat. Kind of, kind of like how we do some games nowadays. Interesting, Interesting. Oh. that's good. And uh, Jed pointed out, too, that Jesus was... Uh, called out to be born in Bethlehem, and that's from Micah 5, too. Yeah, couldn't, like... Couldn't have made that up, yeah. Although, like, if you're going along with your skeptic argument, it could be that he was just born in Bethlehem and decided, hey, well, since I was in the right place, let's just keep going, like... Could have, could have. So that could be <laughs> refuted. So I, um, I take it a lot more personal. I'm sorry. I take it a lot more personal. The reason, to me... It was essential that Jesus fulfilled all these prophecies hundreds of years ahead of time was so that I could show other people yeah, that he definitely. is the Christ, he's alive, and he's living for me and for you. And there's yeah. hope. And yes. That's, that's personally to me, it makes it easier for me to pass his importance in this world along. Um, Levi. Yeah. All right. So that was Tuesday. Yeah. So uh, Dustin had one quick question. Why was it important for the people to identify Jesus being the Messiah based on scripture rather than just based on his miracles? Good question. You can answer that question too. Um, so <laughs> that was a good question. Oh boy. Uh, so why it was important for people to identify him being the Messiah based on scripture. Because um, the evil spirits can do what seem to be miracles. We, so, I, mean, I, mean, that's, it's, I mean, it seems to us to be miracles, and they certainly have capabilities far beyond what we are, and we can be deceived by those. Yeah, so, for sure. Um, so that um, couldn't be the only reason that they would that we could justify him as the savior necessarily. Well, I think, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Another thing I would point out about, um, you know, why have it proved based on the scriptures is the fact that, you know, most Jewish boys had the Torah memorized 
by the time they were 12 years old. Scripture was incredibly important to the people of that day and age. And so for Jesus to be fulfilling these things that they'd had memorized all their lives was really important because that, you know, that's not something that you could just brush aside. That's not something that someone could hide because you could, you know, stop rumors of there being miracles. You could write off the miracles, but you could not write off these prophecies that these people would have known. Mm -hmm. But it didn't seem to impress Saul until, until he was knocked off of his horse. Well, that's, that's the other thing. It's not just about... <laughs> it speaks to different people in different ways. <laughs> well, it's, it's not just about the prophecies, though. It was important for both the scriptures and the miracles to happen because prophecies being fulfilled, that's a, like, it's an impersonal act. Yeah. Whereas meeting with Jesus personally makes all the difference. Yes. I think also it's important because it goes back to Genesis again, the very beginning where sin entered into the world. God wants nothing more than to restore, to restore what this earth was about in the beginning. Yeah. And I think the very first part, it all goes back to the very first prophecy. And I think that's why scripture was important with Jesus, because it all goes back to the very beginning. And what's going to happen in the end, beginning and end? Yeah. Le Levi, what about, yeah. Yeah. What about the Bible as <laughs> history? That's Wednesday. Yes. So we've kind of already tapped on that a lot. Uh, Vixie was talking about how the different kingdoms were foretold as part of prophecy. And then as history rolls around, uh, history actually confirms that the prophetic word was true. So we have Babylon being, uh, when Daniel comes out and tells us prophecies, Babylon was the kingdom at the time. And when Nebuchadnezzar had his dream about the big statue of gold, bronze, and silver, and uh, iron, and, and clay, um, Daniel interprets it. We, he writes it down, talks about it, and is really confused for a little bit, prays about it, and Gabriel comes and in, in, uh, translates and gives the description of what exactly that statue was. And uh, when, from that description, he lays out the kingdoms that are going to come and they actually come to fruition. Uh, Daniel doesn't see it come, but we see it come later, and, and even uh, it dissolves, it comes to a head with the Roman Empire, and the Roman Empire being dissolved later on after um, uh, some of the Old Tests, or the New Testament was, was written. But as far as the Bible being the holy book, it's one of the only holy books that has about 30% of it being prophetic word, and that prophetic word actually coming true. It also tells a lot about history, so as we, uh, you can watch tons of documentaries on Netflix or whatever, but, um, and read about it if you like that kind of way, or watch YouTube things that are from reputable sources. But um, <laughs> it'll talk about how they uh, try to for, um, debate the Bible and how it's false and whatever, and all the stories in there. Like King Nebuchadnezzar was thought to be a fake king until they found Nebuchadnezzar's scroll, which was a little clay uh, scroll talking about his history and his kingdom. And they didn't think he was real until they found it that backed up the Bible more. And then there were several other kings that they found, King Hezekiah and things like that, where they found his, his actual stuff later in archaeology, and it backed up the, the claims of the Bible. Yeah, they thought more. David didn't exist even right. until they found the, um, what, the David tablet or whatever it's called? Daniel 2. Yeah. So a lot of these things were being ba um, backed up as the Bible being an actual historic document. And then even more, um, if, you, if, you, if you're familiar with the Greek philosophers, you've got Socrates, you've got Plato. Um, they, were, they were great philosophical writers that tried to steer humanity in a way that tried to build up a moral basis, per se. And they did it over a whole few generations, approximately like 150 years, of trying to build up their whole uh, Greek mythology. And Jesus changed the world in three and a half years. So with a mentality that they're kind of basing loosely on what their, what their moral teachings were. Jesus came and did it in three and a half years and uh, established a whole kingdom um, that kind of changed the world. It even changed our time and date schedule. We go to A.D. now. So that was something so big. Um, and then we kind of, uh, Bible is history. We kind of, it talks about here on the, in the uh, quarterly, it calls out 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 5, Romans 8, 11, and 1 Thessalonians 4, 14. And those are kind of 
given a brief synopsis of this because of time. It's kind of talking about how um, people actually witnessed Jesus being alive. It wasn't just a couple handful of people that could have been biased. It was actual real-life people that were witnessing Jesus. We had all the disciples do it, Mary Magdalene, uh, Mary, mother of Jesus, did, and a few other spectators. What do you got there? Um, I was just going to say that um, as well as, you know, the people that are in the New Testament, characters in the New Testament that witness Jesus. There's also records from other, um, you know, historical writings, such as the writings of Josephus, yes. that he talks about Jesus. So you can't say, oh, well, Jesus is only in the Bible, so I'm sorry, but I don't believe in the Bible because Jesus does not only exist in the scriptures, he also exists in other historical documents. So That's you right. can't discount, you know, that as being history because we aren't the only ones that are saying this is history. Right. So, so Cher makes a comment that yet still people still refuse to believe in prophecy today. They think because I think where that comes from is Nostradamus and a lot of the other writers they seem to make very extremely vague prophecies, and then you can kind of fit that little puzzle piece, and you can jam it in the puzzle of world history and try to make it fit. As far as the Bible, the Bible sets out that whole guideline, and it is the puzzle. It is the one that is actually creating history. As far as Notre Dame, we're trying to make pieces fit that don't fit. And, and about 1% of his prophecies ever came true. Um, and then that's debatable. Yeah. Now, Dustin, Dustin makes a comment. The miracles revealed God's promises being fulfilled. Miracles happen in one instance and time, but God's promises are available to all people in every part of the world for all time. Not everyone receives a tangible miracle, i.e. John the Baptist, but everyone receives God's promises revealed in Scripture. So true. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's open to everyone. It doesn't matter who you are, what religion you are, what ideology you are. It says all people in the Bible. It talks about all. It doesn't discriminate all. against Jew or Gentile. It just says all. Mm -hmm. So I have another question. Joni. What other historical accounts reference Jesus? Um, so unfortunately i can't give exact documents right now i know that he exists in the writings of josephus yeah. um at the very least um and i know that you know there's a lot of documents that talk not necessarily specifically about jesus but about the followers of jesus and the characteristics that they had and you can certainly see jesus reflected in what early christians were doing for some of that, Johnny, uh, or Joni, sorry, I don't know uh, how to say it exactly, uh, amazingfacts.org will have a plethora of um, information on that exact topic. I'm sorry, we're not too versatile with it. <laughs> Josephus was one of the uh, Jewish, Greek, Jewish historians that did write about Jesus in the actual accounts, and he does write specifically that Jesus walked after he rose, after he was died and put in the tomb, that he walked around and his disciples, the people that followed him, did see him. You we know, have Tacitus, Tacitus? Tacitus. Tacitus is also another historian that wrote about it. And then uh, we Aren't have, we history? Uh, Aren't we history? Yeah. I mean, we have <laughs> yeah. Are you just ignoring the fact that, that we reference Jesus on a regular basis and Christians have referenced Jesus all through history from the very beginning yeah well, after he died right yeah and and the enduring nature of christianity attests to jesus um because you know the fact that jesus lived and died two thousand years ago and here we are in a church today talking about jesus that's true you know the christianity is a movement that has not died despite a lot of persecution, a lot of different issues that have arisen. Christianity has not died and will not die because of the fact that Jesus was a real person, that Jesus is a real person, mm -hmm. is still in existence with us. 
And uh, some other, someone said a comment by a church account. So Case for Christ is another example. Uh, Lee Strobel was a atheist journalist that was out of Chicago, set out to prove why his, prove his wife wrong for converting to Christianity. And so in, in order to prove her wrong, he dove right into all these different resources such as church historians, um, people that studied the Bible for 40 years, uh, archaeologists, stuff like that. And basically he came down to there was no reason to not believe that Jesus Christ was a real person, number one, that he actually said, did and said who he was. So he claimed to be, and he said to be God incarnate and the son of God. And there was no reason to not believe that he wasn't. Based upon fulfilling all the prophecies that happened, based upon actually rising from the dead and actually creating a movement, if you want to call it that, a religious movement that changed the world more than any person in history could ever be. Any Time magazine, what, declared Jesus as the most influential person to ever live. You know, there's, there's other evidence, too, of how that Jesus is a real person and that the Bible is true is evidence in the changed lives. Yes, changed lives. Yep. Changed lives. People who are thieves, drug addicts, become leader of great churches. Yeah. <laughs> um, how can you account for that without some supernatural effect? We have people who have anger problems become lovers. Yeah, lovers, we yeah. Have, you can name any fault we have as human beings and you can show someone who has changed entirely by the scripture and by Jesus. That just doesn't happen with Plato. <laughs> that just doesn't happen with any of the ancient writers that happens with the Bible. And I that kind of goes into Thursday now, the transforming power of the word. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Um, as far as what, uh, what we were just talking about with the different people that um, have commented or commentated on Jesus, and going off of what you were saying with Lee Strobel, actually um, another atheist that became a Christian is the author C.S. Lewis. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I didn't actually know that for a long time. But he, um, he writes a book that I would highly recommend to literally anyone called Mere Christianity, in which he lays out a logical case for Christ, a logical case why there has to be a higher power. And it's a really good read for anyone that's interested in that's that. That's a good place to start. And then if you struggle with why God has suffering in this world and and things like that. There's another book called The Odyssey of Love by John Peckham yeah. that kind of can make your mind wrap around the whole idea of suffering and the laws of engagement that God and Satan have to deal with in this, in this time and the great controversy. Well, and the wonderful thing about all these resources, too, is the fact that they point back to the scriptures. And that's where our search should always start yep. and always end. It's wonderful to look at resources that we have between the beginning and the end. But remember, the Bible is the source for our information about Jesus. That's why it's so important. That's why this quarter is so important in an attempt to bring Christians back to a daily, methodical study of the Bible. I think that without that, I think we're in trouble. So this is a very timely quarter for this church and for Christianity. Um, what, a, what else about transforming power of the word that we can kind of talk about? We got like five minutes, right? Yeah. Five minutes. Anyone else want to comment on from our Facebook Live group? Any more questions? You know, Sharon's making a comment. Sharon says Billy Graham said Christ 
not just for one person, but Christ is for the whole world. Well, and beyond Billy Graham saying that, the Bible itself says yeah. that. You know, Jesus died not just for one person, but for everyone while we were yet sinners. That's not while I was still a sinner. It's while we, all of us collectively, were sinners, Christ died. In the most famous Bible verse, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. For sure, yes. Mm -hmm. And the Bible is the word, the word of God, and Jesus is the word of God. I think we must always bring the conversation back to Jesus. He lived in our time, if you want to say it, really. He, he wasn't, it wasn't, there wasn't like ancient way back at the time of the flood. He lived, he lived among us, among, among the people he created. So I think this has been a wonderful lesson. I want to thank each and every one of you. It, you, you guys are awesome. This, is, this worked out so well, and we hope that you, our audience, have enjoyed it. And I think that it's time for us to close. Levi, could you have a word of prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much again for this Sabbath day. Thank you so much for the ability for us to kind of present our um, biblical views, our biblical, um, the actual biblical truth from the quarterly to share with these people as they watch. We know that they're isolated. They, and, um, we know that the whole world is kind of being isolated right now, but we know that your word can reach each and every one of us as though uh, Paul was, was in prison when he was writing most of his words, and so we feel like we're kind of isolated and in prison, but we can still get the word of God out. And I pray that we, our hearts are touched and the spirit fills. Amen.